Welcome to TFR Let's Talk. I'm your host, Sopin Bhartia, and my next guest is John Egan, CEO of Kintaba. John, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, great to be here. You are co-founder of the company and also, of course, CEO. I want to know a bit about the company itself. Can you talk about the problem that you saw in the space that you were trying to solve that you created the company? Yeah, so my company is called Kintaba. Uh, we're an incident management suite designed to make it so that any organization can implement incident response processes, uh, the best practice processes that we saw as employees at, com- at Facebook um, and that we saw mirrored at other major organizations like Google and Netflix. When you say incident management, how would you define it? So there's always been an interesting white space between what you call task management, so predictable things that are coming up that you want to plan for, and catastrophic emergency, right? The situations where you can definitely say, this is an incident, this is a a situation we need to deal with. And managing within that white space of all the different types of real-time events that you need to respond to as an organization, as a team, is really where incident management comes into place. It's everything from the decision-making around how you want to categorize it. Is this a SEV3? Is this low priority? Is this a SEV1? Um, All the way through to how you come together and collaborate real time. Where's the place you come together? How is that logged? How do you bring other people together to respond to that incident? Um, All the way through to the learning, which is we had a real time unexpected situation. Now, how do we make sure that never happens again? We call that the postmortem process. So an incident management suite or an incident management product like Kintaba is really there to make sure that you follow that best practice process every time you have a major incident in such a way that you're not thinking about that overhead and administration. You're focusing on fixing the problem, learning, and becoming more resilient as an organization. When we look at IT landscape, it's kind of mixed, complicated. We either talk about you know things running in companies. So I want to understand from you is who do you cater to? Uh, are you looking at cloud native workloads? Are you looking at you know uh, you know within companies firewalls? So I wanted, yeah, if you can explain a bit more from Kintaba's point of view. So we we normally target organizations today that are following the lead of those other tech unicorns like the Facebooks and Google. So these tend to be other rapidly growing tech organizations um, that are following uh, you know the the sort of modern infrastructure implementation process. Uh, oftentimes we'll see them built on on top of cloud services like AWS or otherwise. You know they're already practicing some degree of DevOps uh, internally in terms of their automated deployment processes, um, and they're really kind of finding themselves in a slipstream of how they efficiently and rapidly build. And within that slipstream and that abstraction that you get into, right, with DevOps and, and making your processes sort of managed at the top level as opposed to, you know, managing each microservice individually, um, you run into potentially more of these types of incidents and you have to be a little bit more tooled internally to deal with them day to day as opposed to just saying, well, we'll deal with those major incidents the one or two times they happen per year, right? It becomes a little bit more of a, of a part of doing business on almost day to day is is how do we manage these unexpected situations, um, oftentimes due to the complexity beneath the um, abstracted infrastructure that they've implemented. Right. And when you talk about, you know, these incidents, what exactly would you uh, point at? Because when we do look at cloud native, first of all, almost every company is today moving to uh, cloud. Uh, yes, they have on-prem deployments. That's why we talk about hybrid cloud, multi-cloud. I mean, Edge is becoming a very interesting use case. Uh, so there are a couple of things that, that happen when you do talk about, hey, something happened. One is that maybe because of some misconfiguration, something got triggered, maybe because of the bug, maybe spike in traffic, maybe lack of resources. So what triggers these incidents? Can you talk about it? So I, I think The nature of incidents is such that we often don't know what's going to trigger them. What we know is the general categorization within the organization of the type of incident. In fact, this is a big part of setting up an incident management team inside of your company and an incident response process is understanding that you can really only bucket these things at generally their top level, right? So either within a specific cloud, within a specific maybe customer region, you can sort of bucket, but you can't actually predict all the way down necessarily to the microservice where you're going to have an outage. Um, so it's hard to answer that question from the standpoint of you know, exactly what triggers these incidents. Um, at, at, a, you know, at a company like Facebook, these incidents can be everything from 
uh, you know, cascading failures of databases, you know, all the way out to less technical situations like uh, privacy situations where there's an architectural issue that needs to be dealt with in real time that constitutes risk to the business. Um, and therefore, it doesn't just belong in a project management, you know, task tracking application. It really belongs in this thing where we're tracking responders, we're tracking real time movement, and we want it closed out, you know, as quickly as possible. So, how different is uh, incident management from observability or understandability? Where you know observability, it, uh, monitoring, tracking. I mean, I, I, I think there is some overlap. So, I just want to. Uh, understand it more clearly. Yeah, so uh, we generally see observability, for example, as a tool that you're using within the incident response process. So something has gone wrong. Um, you, you've got you've got spiking you know uh, numbers across your uh, uh, you know latency, or you've got you know dropping numbers on your egress. And your observability tools really can come in either as detectors for that if you're monitoring these you know down to the microservice level, uh, or they can be investigation tools that get brought into place to go and say, okay, well where is this happening? We know the macro situation right that's causing this, or potentially the signal, and we're working our way down to a cause. Um, incident management as a practice. Uh, generally is built around the idea of starting in a very ambiguous situation. You normally have a signal that's brought you to the state of an incident, and it's generally an unexpected signal. So oftentimes they're coming in from channels that you don't even expect. They'll come from customers, where you know the worst case incident situation can often be, you know, all of my charts and metrics are fine, everything's green, but I'm getting consistent feedback from my customers that my site is down or that our service isn't operating, right? Then you would employ a tool like observability in your incident response team and response process to say, let's start to narrow this thing down, let's say, What's the cause? What's the root reason for this problem? And then as you find that and you're spreading that information out, that's where you're using the collaboration tools and incident response processes like Kentaba to share, here's what I've discovered, here's where we think the problem is. Like, let's get a response team now over on this team spun up, let's ping the person who's on call. You know, really incident management's the glue between these tools that are already pretty heavily implemented. I want to talk a bit about the cultural side as well, because if you look at, no matter where we look at it, a technology does offer solutions, but it's people, it's socially how you look at them. When you talk about incident, you know, culture or management, what I also see is we talk about chaos engineering a lot where you do uh, kind of prepare companies because you do not know what might happen, so, but is your system ready for that? So how much play a role does chaos engineering play in the wider incident management strategy? Right, so on the cultural side, um, chaos engineering really plays into this uh, basic idea inside of incident management, which is an acceptance that you're going to have incidents. The, the sort of unpleasant old world, right, was to say, well, our goal is to have no incidents, right? Like incident zero, we're not going to ever have these things. And the reality is that resilient organizations don't take that tack, right? They very aggressively take the tack of, no, these are going to happen. And it's critical that our practices are really well built and in place before it happens. And so we really see a product like Kentaba sitting next to chaos engineering in a really friendly manner in that if you're practicing chaos engineering, if you're, if you're causing incidents intentionally, then this is the system System that you're able to marry to that to say, and then here's what we're going to do when that incident happens. And we can test this response process with something like chaos engineering. So you'll notice there's a great overlap between the companies that I just listed and the companies really that chaos engineering grew out of, right? So Netflix is a perfect example, right? Netflix has a, has a very evolved chaos engineering organization internally, and it also has a very evolved incident management practice inside. And so when we think about culture, that's a big part, right? The culture of these are going to happen. The other part of that culture, which plays on chaos engineering a little bit less, but is still relevant, is the, the culture of actually sort of celebrating these incidents and saying these are actually moments that we don't want to sweep under the rug and say, let's pretend that they didn't happen, you know, let's let's punish the engineers involved, right? And instead saying we knew these were going to happen. And when they happened, we were able to bring together the right team and the right experts, and they responded in an admirable fashion, right? And so companies like Google will actually have like incident of the month where the engineering leaders will bring those incidents up in front of everyone and then bring the responding engineer up and they'll talk about, you know, what they did and what they learned. Because going back to your point about cloud infrastructure, um, the reality is an incident that impacts one team 
probably has interesting implications on other teams, even if they weren't involved in that specific incident. So celebrating those incidents and doing a better job of propagating that information and the learnings actually causes like a larger scale resilience effect within the organization. And I think in terms of DevOps community as a whole, we're actually moving to a world where we talk about these things at an industry level, right? We talk about these things at Hacker News and we do public postmortems and we talk more uh, aggressively about how did we respond and what did we learn because because odds are that unicorn startup that had an outage last week is probably sitting on very similar infrastructure that your little bootstrap 10 person company is on. You're probably both on AWS. And I think that that part of the culture is doing a great job of propagating publicly and is encouraging more people to practice it internally who maybe you know feel less comfortable with taking that approach today. Yeah, you mentioned resiliency and sometimes a lot of, not a lot of, some companies are actually C-level executives, they just kind of panic when they hear the word chaos engineering. That's why they, I think, prefer the word, you know, site, you know, reliability. That's why SREs uh, are kind of uh, becoming more and more popular. Uh, so can you can you talk, I'll stay with the, the culture. Uh, one more question regarding culture is that, uh, if you look at company as you're talking about, you know, that your company may be running on the same kind of infrastructure that the other company is running on, but your, <laughs> your uh, uh, incident management may be different. So you might experience downtime, whereas someone else running on the same infrastructure, same set of open source tools may not. So can you talk about uh, what do you see uh, I mean, we talk about SRE culture, we talk about DevOps culture, we talk DevSecOps culture. What do you see about having a incident culture internally? Of course, as you said, the lines get blurred so easily when we talk about S observability, SREs, and chaos engineering. It does kind of start to overlap because you are changing the culture of the company. So can you talk about culture also so that the companies are prepared socially, people-wise also, because tools and technologies are available, but if they don't know what to use, when to use it, what's the point? Right, so uh, when we're thinking about how companies implement this type of culture, you know, who are just getting started, we really give them, you know, two or three major suggestions where, where one is, you, know, you really need to lead from the executive level. You really need to bring this celebration of incidents forward on day one. And if you don't act that way, no one below you is going to act that way. Everyone's going to kind of, you know, reflect what their leaders are doing. Um, mm -hmm. That's sort of a base level approach that has to be taken before you do anything. On the tooling front, you know, we've always said that the best way to implement a process is to implement a tool. The hardest way to culturally change a company is to go write a document and post it onto a wiki somewhere and say, everyone, please read this document, right? The best way to make a cultural change inside of a company is to make public and available the information about how the company is already acting now that they've implemented this tool in terms of how they respond. And that that openness really encourages more uh, implementation you know, of, of best practices across the company. So something like Kentava, right? Kentava works really hard to make sure your incident dashboard is available to the whole company. Because even if you were just hired on the sales team, you know, maybe you're in customer success, you're not even involved in any of the SRE or, or, or technical teams, right? You need that visibility to be able to propagate that culture so that you have uh, an understanding of, you know, here's what the fires are right, right now inside of our company. And I know who worked on them. And next time there's a major fire, I might might be involved. It might be something that impacted one of my customers. And so I'm actually pulled into that collaborative chat room and my feedback is asked for, you know, can you reach out to this customer for us? Can you get more details on this problem that's happening? So I really feel like those are the two big things, right? So, so lead from the front when you're changing culture and then propagate publicly throughout the organization your tooling for how you're going to solve that problem versus telling people, let's all go read this document and you know feel good about it in a seminar this afternoon. Uh, I think we see a lot of that happening you know, with, with SaaS tools in general, right? Um, I think Asana did a great job of this in the task space early on. They said, just give this tool to everyone and that will create the culture you desire. Don't necessarily you know, have to go in and, and write a book. Now, I want to switch gears and uh, uh, talk purely from technology perspective. Um, can you talk about, uh, from Kintaba's perspective, what kind of solutions, what kind of tools that you are offering for the ecosystem, players, communities, users? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, in, in our world, we really offer you know, this sort of suite. We offer this dashboard 
which is your view into what's currently happening at the company that should be available to hopefully everyone in the organization. Um, we offer the actual uh, designation experience, which is how am I declaring an incident right now? And that can be done in the dashboard, that can be done in Slack, that can be done upstream in the API. We provide all sorts of different inputs that you can use to create these incidents. Um, interesting side note there, it turns out almost all incidents are created by humans. We think about them as things that can be detected and automatically generated, but the reality is the nature of these things is they're unexpected. And so normally the signals that are causing them to be initially filed, especially the most interesting incidents, come in from the side. And a human sort of makes that designation. They say this collection of alerts is an incident or this you know, other, other feed that I'm getting mentally is causing me to go and create this incident. Um, and then we provide that tooling for actually doing the response. So we bi-directionally sync into Slack. You can operate in the Kintaba UI or the Slack UI to actually have that conversation about how are we solving this thing. Um, and then we provide the tools to reach out to the responders and the roles. Who's my security on call? Who's my uh, technical on call inside the customer success team? Who's the database on call, right? All that information is stored in Kintaba, uh, or we can leverage your existing solution if you have something like PagerDuty. And then finally, we have a postmortem library and editor, which allows you to um, access a, a, a knowledge library of information created based on the incidents that have happened. And it helps you propagate that information across your company. A lot of the time we'll ask organizations, we'll say, well, how many people read your last postmortem? You know, and, and it's very rarely even tracked. Like people don't know. People just think of them as things that are written. And you know, engineers, they're, they're, they, don't, they don't spend time writing things that no one reads. And so it's really important to have all of those pieces in one place because you could stitch tools together to do this, right? You could go write a custom Slack bot for yourself. You could spin up a channel every time it happens. You could have an Excel sheet maybe that's shared with the whole company where you track the active incidents. You could link that into Jira. You know, you could wire into Google Docs folders for your postmortems. Just the reality is if you do it that way, it's going to be very difficult to make sure that everyone's following that consistent process without sharing wiki documents around. And so our goal really is to take all of those disparate processes and bring them together and just make it easy. It's one click. You don't have to talk to a sales team. You can click a button on our website and be up and running in 10 minutes. Cloud native is already a very, very complicated space. <laughs> if you look at just CNCF logo, uh, sorry, landscape, there are so many logos up there. Uh, if I ask you, uh, of course, you cannot share the whole playbook, but can you suggest some approaches, some tips, how companies should approach when they are building their incident management strategy, whether it's for purely technical point of view or cultural and social point of view? What are the right steps they should take? It's a hard question to answer for every company. Uh, I think when you're, when you're particularly small, engaging the cultural side early is critical because changing a culture of a very large company is pretty hard. Um, changing a culture of any company is pretty hard, but it's much easier when you're getting right off the ground. So even if you're, you know, consider yourself too soon for incident tooling, which which we don't really think there is a lower barrier, but if you consider yourself too 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 early for it, at least getting in that openness mindset within your organization of sharing the information, writing your postmortems, publishing them publicly, even if no one's reading them outside, will start you kind of on that drumbeat. Um, Cloudflare did a great job of this. They actually have a blog. I think it's called the Outage Blog, and and it's, that's, it's, it's from their very early days all the way up to today. And it's a discussion of the outages that they have. And I think that was a really healthy cultural thing for them to do from day one. Um, on the technical side, uh, I would actually encourage people to do as, as little as possible from the technical side. You really want to go, I, I really do believe, not just as a builder of this space, but like you should take a product like this off the shelf. Um, internally building it and having to structure it and continue to keep up with the best practices around how to do your collaboration, how you're recording these things, storing to your various cloud providers that change over time, it's actually pretty difficult. Um, and it's a distraction from what you're actually trying to do day to day, which is probably get customers, build an exciting and engaging experience. So the more you can kind of alleviate that administrative burden, the better. And so, you know, I, I, I look at tools oftentimes and I'll, I'll tell people, you know, you want to be able to pick as few as possible when you're getting up and running. And sometimes it's kind of tossed back to me as, well, then why would we adopt something like Kentava? It's another tool. But you're looking for tools that sort of remove your need for other tools to be stitched together because that switching between tools, context switching mentally, will just cause people to file fewer incidents, right? They'll look at the process and they'll say, well, 
this isn't really important enough to put in there. And every time someone does that, you lose out on knowledge and your company becomes less resilient. John, thank you so much for uh, talking about, of course, incident management. But I think the basic idea is to ensure that, uh, look, uh, you can use any cloud provider, you can build whatever services you want, awesome. But if they're not reliable, if, if the customers cannot access it when they need it, what is the point? So, so building such a strategy is as important as building a cool uh, app and service. So thanks for sharing those insights. And also, uh, I appreciate the tips, the suggestions that you shared that how companies should approach it. And I love what you said that they should not hide incident, they should celebrate those incidents. That was great. So thanks for your insight and I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you for your time today. Great, thank you so much.